coming to you live from downtown Detroit. This is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Friday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joel Elkanen and Dennis Dick. We're going to continue on this merry little earnings parade. Some other news as well. IBM, new CEO, uh, WWE uh, is asking a couple of their executives as well. And we're going to continue talking about the developments uh, in the market as it relates to the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, Weird market this morning. Uh, Amazon up, market down. We'll talk about that. Our guest today, Jonathan Corpina, Senior Managing Partner at Meridian Equity Partners. He will join us at 8.35. Uh, Joel, what's the word here in the overnight? Uh, once again, we're dealing with a red open here, Spencer. Uh, made a pre-market high at 97.50. Tried to break into the 3,300 handle. No can do. Pre-market low down at 65.75. And the way this market swooshed up yesterday, I just have a hard time finding support here. In the market, uh, so let's just look for a follow through on the downside through that pre market low of 65.75. Crude trying to get off the mat here, up 15 cents at 52.29. No fear as far as gold is concerned, down four dollars at 15.85.20. Silver in the red by 14.2 cents at 17.85. And Bitcoin trying to get to 10,000, but down 330 dollars at 9,000. 400 that's your march bitcoin futures uh triple d we're gonna bring you in here now what are you seeing in the pre-market oh just such an interesting market what are we not seeing in the pre-market i mean this is you know one you don't see every single day amazon up 201 points and the s and p's are red you do not see that one every day when is the last time we saw um one of our major major you know bellwethers for this market and i mean if you look at amazon let's just go and do the fun thing of you know breaking in and looking at the etfs because it is a substantial portion of every single like of the majority of your etfs out here i mean of the queues itself it is 7.88 percent of the queues queues are still i believe green because it's just up so much amazon that obviously that entire gain is just amazon uh but you know even looking at the spy i believe spy which is red, I believe Amazon's over 2.5% of that as well. So we just jump in and yes, Amazon is 2.86% of the SPY too. So if we just do our fun math, let's just look and you know this gives you a better perspective because you might be like, why is the market trading down? Well, we know it's trading down because it's still concerned about this virus, but um, jump in and look at Amazon just on the QQQ. So we said, I'm doing the math here on the live on the show here. So sure. I'm just Bring it on. QQQ is 7.88%. So 0.0788 times Amazon is up roughly, let's call it, let's call it 10.2%. So we go 0.1092. And that means that the S&Ps should, or the the QQQ, I did the math wrong. It's basically the QQQ should be up about 0.08% just to account for Amazon. It's, so yeah. it's up 0.35%. So that's telling you the rest of the QQQ is the other 99 components. If I did that math correctly, I did it really fast there. If I did that math correctly, it's telling you the rest of the market is trained down half a percent. So don't come in here expecting you know your all your QQQ components to be in the green because they it needs to be a lot of them in the red simply because Amazon is up so much. So the index is deceiving here. On normal days, QQQ would probably be up two points, three points on this. It was, well, it was up a couple points last night. It would be up a lot more. You know, it, it could even be up one or two percent on normal days. This is not normal markets. There is a substantial amount of stocks trading in the red, obviously led by China. You know, it's, it seems like we had a nice little bounce in China yesterday. Um, well, not yesterday, but not two two days ago. Um, and they took that opportunity to sell. They come in here selling again. So thoughts here, Joel, Amazon obviously tries to hold the market up, does a good job last night, market craters, and not immediately, but couldn't hold the gains overnight. Thoughts? Thoughts like how could the street be so wrong on this, you know, with the, the estimates, uh, right? I mean, 
They nearly doubled it. I mean, this is great. This is great for this quarter. You this, know, this, and- let's stop and just interrupt you for a second. These earnings, this earnings season has been fabulous, really. No, you yeah. know, besides Facebook, you know, Amazon is awesome. We can see that today. Just, just crazy. Blow it away. Apple, great numbers. Microsoft, great numbers. I mean, we've had a few stocks lagging, but, you know, of the big guns, you know, the fang, really, Facebook's been the only disappointer so far. And I mean, Amazon, 200 points. They're doing their job. They're trying to help this market out. Market's still not up. That is somewhat concerning. I hope it goes green. I hope we turn it around. But I think there's a lot of people spooked right now. I, I think the earnings uh, at the earnings estimate was lower because people thought that the, the same same day shipping was gonna was gonna be really expensive, and and it wasn't. Did we do the numbers yet? And it wasn't as expensive. No, I'll give them to you right now. The, yeah. The same day uh, same day shipping for the for the holiday season wasn't as expensive as they initially thought. I mean, the earnings were great. They earned it six dollars and forty seven cents per share. Estimate was at four dollars and three cents, so they 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 beat it by like fifty percent. Uh, revenue eighty seven point four versus eighty six billion dollars, and it's all about the cloud. AWS uh, is their uh, fastest growing business nine point nine five billion dollars in revenue from AWS. That was above the estimate as well. So they they just blew the earnings out of the water. What was the straddle on this? I got to go price out the straddle. Joel, give me well, technical I, thoughts. I got to price. While, while you're pricing out the straddle, it closed it. Uh, 1870, right? Yeah. What do you think they wanted for the 2000 call? 130 points out of the money. It's hard to make money buying options. What do they want? Three bucks. They still wanted three bucks, but that's a pretty good move. So they still wanted three bucks, but holy mackerel, it's $80. That's a 20 timer. That's a 20 bagger. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. But that's a good one. But that's still, you know, pretty incredible premium. But the person who sold that, Oh. Obviously, the person who came in and sold that, and for some reason, I can't see. I don't have the January options up. So, if somebody know what the okay, straddle I'm, was. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm like, you have it up. Um, uh, it's coming up in a second. There, I would say if the uh, if the Tesla one was sixty, this had to be. It's a high, you know higher price stock. It's probably was like. But Tesla's more volatile. I would have guessed like 50, 60 bucks. Okay. I, if I was guessing right now. In this market, I guess it was fifty or sixty bucks. All right, so it closed at eighteen seventy point sixty eight. So once this comes, just grab up, the closest it, one. Right, 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 right. Man. Today's expiration. I got it. I Spencer, did, you gave the numbers, right? Yeah, he did. Okay, so the eighteen. Oh man, now I'm gonna have to go all here on this platform. Sixty six points, Spinner says. I guess fifty to sixty. Yeah. Good guess. Sixty six is what Spinner was saying. So it's three times, yeah, it's three times the expected move. Straddle Raiders, not doing well on this one. Thought that the two, you're right, the 2000 call Raider, which probably that person thought, no, no way, no hell. <laughs> oh, it's $80 above it. So that call Raider is like, oops, you know, that's a pretty, you know, this is the one thing about right and naked puts and naked calls. When you get that big move in one direction, you can really get hurt. And, you know, that's why, you know, you got to be, you know, cautious with how many you write, because sometimes people write a few too many thinking, ah, oh, it's safe. I'm just going to make myself a thousand bucks here or a couple thousand here. I'll make myself a thousand bucks. I'll write three of these call, three of these, you know, uh, at, at three, at three points and uh, we'll be okay. Right. Three of these calls, some 2000, well, it's 80 points. So on that $1,000, you just took in, now you're down 25 grand. You know what? People don't play these options. They don't. Because not I'm much, little, not much, not much open interest on that. No, uh, I would say in the puts, and this is for well, well that I, was a long ways out. Oh way, yeah, so. those are too far out. Yeah, you're yeah. right. If you get near the money, then they play them more. But yeah, let me see here. But even near, oh, man, there's just so many. Uh, there's so many options on this thinkorswim platform here. Um, and Spinner uh, makes a good point here too. Um, if you're quick and I know Christian from Hertz did this on Tesla. He had, I believe some, you know, he had an iron condor going, but he had some calls written on Tesla and he was quick to buy the stock after hours on the beat. So he hedged himself with the stock and that was smart because then, you know, you're not going to take the licking, but I mean, this was fast, Joel, look at bring it up. So, you know, hindsight's 2020, obviously. And I say, well, I just rip and buy the stock after hours, but this thing ripped really, really, really fast. I know because I got picked off on some ETFs that were loaded up with it. Um, that I was, you know, out there just making a wide, wide market, thinking no way. And um, I was like, whoa, <laughs> regroup here, regroup. So um, you can see the move. It was really fast. 
Yeah, let me. Uh, oh man, so I'll just give. No trouble with her charts today. I don't see the chart. No, well, I had it up. That's what's up. I I had it up. I'll bring it back. But you guys had the uh, the options conversation going. So, but well, no, we want to see the chart though because that's what applies to the options. It was an incredible move. Like that move, that one candle. It was up over two thousand bucks very very quickly. Like I didn't notice um, the move, so I'm saying it was under like thirty seconds. It went from eighteen seventy to over two thousand. So. It was a very quick move. And they were quick to release this, too. It was like 4 o'clock, like right after 4 o'clock. Like, usually it's a few minutes. Sometimes it's not right on the button. They didn't play games with this one. They got that those numbers out. They were excited okay. to get these here, numbers here, out here. there. <clears throat> this is uh, starting at uh, 1601, okay? It closed it, uh, and these are the um, the prints. It's 1601, 1873.45. 1602, 1988.88. So one 16, minute later, 1603, 2035. Two minutes. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. But it's hard. You know, you're trying to react. You're trying to think. But you look at those initial numbers and the people who are just buying the news algo. We always talk about the news algo losing money. They made money on this one. <laughs> they made a lot of money on this one. That news algo says buy, buy, buy all the way up. They made some money on this one. 2113 or 2133.74 is your after hours high that was at 1619 things have settled down this morning uh you had a little dip off the 4 a.m open uh went to 2026 so there's yours i'll give a nice little range on this one 2020 21 26 no i'm talking about your low if you would have got up at uh four in the morning oh it, how it low 2026 how was the high? What was the after I was high last night? I just gave that 2133.70. 2133. Wow. wow Such an impressive move. And obviously, SPY and Q's ripped on this. Like, I mean, yep. they the SPY went up like a dollar in a matter of a minute and a half, too, because it's so much of it. And if you looked, and if you're looking at the other components, a lot of them were not going up in sympathy because Amazon was up so much, the ETF effects on the ARB didn't allow the other stocks to go up. Because Amazon was over, Amazon was worth more than the entire gain in some of these uh, ETFs last night. So Would you, it was you just turn around so and cover those ones that you got picked off on, or do you try and buy something else? Um, there's a bunch of ETFs, and obviously everybody knows XLY. So I back off on XLY. XLY, it's loaded. So if we just look and we go to our ETFs and we look at what you know has the most Amazon, I believe the, of the of the liquid ones. There's some illiquid ones, but of the liquid ones, it's XLY. That's the one. 23.4% of XLY is Amazon. So obviously, just doing quick math, Amazon's up 10%. That means XLY has to be up 2.3% just for Amazon. XLY is not up that much. It's only up 2% right now because the overall market is down. So you've got to consider all that too. But um, VUG is one I got I got picked off on. Um, making yeah. a wide market and not wide enough, apparently. Um, I was uh, And I actually ended up making money on the trade because I, I, I got picked off near the highs. So it ended up working out, but it's still like, you know, regroup. If that would have kept going, I would have had to do some scrambling in a hurry, but it stalled out for a little bit there. That was when the stock was about maybe 2080 before I made the, the next move leg up to 2130. But, you know, there's a lot of, you know, VUG, Amazon's only 5.51%. But like I said, even on SPY, you know, you're sitting out there on the SPY, you think, oh, it's only 2.7%. You think you're good, you know, to go that, you know, and it's not going to be an extreme move to really have that much impact on SPY. When something moves 10%, it impacts all, you know, and it's 2.7% of the index. That's a significant move. That's 0.27% just to make up for Amazon. So big moves. All right, let's, let's talk about the IBM news here. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, just your casual CEO shakeup. After uh, eight years, Ginny Rometty is out as the CEO of IBM. They have named uh, their cloud chief, the, the, the head of their cloud unit, Arvind uh, Krishna, their new CEO. So... Uh, Junior Remedy's uh, uh, eight-year tenure ends with IBM, the shares of IBM at least falling twenty-five uh, percent over, over the course of her of her time. I think they closed they closed like a couple hundred transactions. Of, obviously, the Red Hat transaction being the big one from a couple years ago there. But we talked about IBM a couple days ago when they reported uh, and how it just hasn't grown and hasn't grown, and they they buy they bought their way to growth and. So follow through from that is Ginny Remini out as CEO. Not surprising. I mean, when the stock has underperformed as much as you just said with those numbers, 
eventually you need change. So the market is applauding change this morning. The stock is up 4%. We know GE eventually turned it around or as, you know, at least turned it around since the lows. <laughs> I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say they've turned it around, but you know, the stock has performed quite well here since the new CEO is in. I believe the stock is up like something to the tune of somebody was saying 30% since the new CEO is in. So, you know, still when you look at GE and the all time highs at 60 and you look at it at 12, you think, well, I haven't performed very well, but um, obviously IBM here want to change. Maybe they can start to figure it out. Um, obviously still cash cow, still got a nice dividend. We've talked about that. They need to figure out the growth. They did the red hat acquisition. Maybe that's going to help a bit. Maybe this new CEO can figure out other ways to grow the company's uh, top line because the top line hasn't grown in so long. That's why the stock's been in the gutter. Um, well, what's it now that someone gave that statistic about, uh, GE, but when Culp actually resigned or who's Culp the new one, who, who is he the new one? Yeah. Yeah. When someone resigned, that stock got a huge pop. And I think that's the last time it traded $14. I remember they had it up like a stick and then it sold off. So, I mean, these kind of things are. I mean, does this make the company immediately better today? I don't know. I I think there's some overhead supply here. People got stuffed buying that earnings report, right? You had to gap. It was off. Flannery, by the way, yep. you were talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what John Flannery. <sighs> so I I don't know. I I just I don't see I don't see how this is immediately helping the company maybe going this always forward. happens though joel i mean you can challenge yeah. the moves but whenever you have a stock in the gutter and they yep. get a new they get a management change there's always an immediate response the market doesn't price any immediate action the market prices out what they think is going to happen in three to six months or you know out down the road we know that because even when we talk on earnings it's always the guidance that is more important than the current numbers people want to know what's happening going forward so it's not surprising to me at all i'm not coming in here and saying fade IBM up five. Nope. The one consideration again is what I said yesterday though, even Microsoft, the great numbers when Microsoft was 175 yesterday, I was like, I'm not buying it up here because I'm not buying anything. In normal markets, I said, this could be a gap and go. This is not normal markets. There's a lot of concerns out here with the virus. And I think there's profit taking across the board. We saw it with Apple two days ago. We saw it with Microsoft yesterday. We're seeing it with Amazon to a certain extent. I mean, it's off the highs, but you know, Amazon's still doing pretty dang good up 200 points. So, um, I think there's buyers on dips if it pulls back significantly from here. But again, it's hard to buy stocks with this cloud until they get this thing figured out. We haven't talked much about the coronavirus here yet today, but until they get this, you know, coronavirus, at least stop. You know, it, it's still going up and following that progression chart that we talked about uh, three days ago. It is. And the numbers get really ugly next week. So they need to get this thing contained now. They need to start seeing those numbers um, you know, it's the, the rate of increase start to decline, meaning, you know, not going up 30, 40, 50% a day. We need to see those numbers start to come in and that will show some containment. We have not seen that yet. The numbers are following that progression chart almost perfectly, um, even on the death part of it. So it's scary. I mean, we're over SARS numbers and we don't know what the mortality rate is. They're saying, you know, 2%, but the way they calculate that I even challenged that because I tweeted this out last night. I mean, you take the current number of cases and you do the deaths divided by, and that's a simplistic calculation of it to say 2%. But the people aren't dying on the first day they're diagnosed. So that's why you have to look back to like, are the people dying are probably the ones that are seven to day, 10 days into it. So if you go back and look at where the numbers were seven to 10 days ago, they were significantly different. So well, the, the mortality rate is likely to be a lot higher. I've also heard the other argument that we don't know all the cases, so we're seeing all the deaths. I don't know if we are seeing all the deaths. There could be people dying that are, you know, getting misdiagnosed. I mean, they just died of the flu and they didn't know they were coronavirus. I mean, those hospitals are taxed right now. Are they really that concerned with figuring out everything else? I mean, there's so much information we just don't know about it. Uh, the one thing, China did say that the number of deaths uh, remained unchanged day over day. Uh, what? So, Yeah. Uh, 230. It was up 42 or whatever yesterday. You're telling me that it was a lie? No, that's not what I saw. I saw 213 confirmed deaths. Uh, Which is over 40 more from the previous day. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Well. The deaths were up substantially. All right. We we know, and if I don't know if you have the progression chart in front of us again, but it is following it almost perfectly so oh. far. It needs uh, to stop well, following it because uh, next week the numbers get crazy. 
go, uh, I think it was go for the W. Uh, if you could, he uh, they put a great, uh, great link in the chat yesterday before the show started. Uh, you can scroll up and find it, but uh, I would ask him to drop it in there again. It was a really good link of that, just a dashboard of of all the confirmed cases uh, around the globe and, and that sort of thing. So really good. Some, and you know what number scares me? And I was talking there to my buddy from Bright. The yep. number that scares me the most is not, you know, the number of cases going up. It's the number of healed. I don't know what that means. It's coming from China. But if we looked at the stats from, um, you know, that were released yesterday, there's like 200, what's the death count? I, I don't have the stats in front of me. It's like 214 though, I'm just ballparking it. But there was only a hundred, here it is, 213 deaths, they're all in China, but there's only 171 recovered. So what does that mean? And then there's, there's, they said there's 1600 in serious or critical condition. So if those people, if half of those people don't make it, this mortality rate is significantly higher. I mean, this is the scary thing. And if you're looking, and some people are looking at it this way, and this is, you can't look at it this way, but if you did, you look at deaths to recovery. Um, if 213 people die, only 171 recovered, that mortality rate is up over 50%. So they can't look at it that way because some of these people, you know, what does recovered mean? We don't know. We know what death means. Maybe recovered means the virus has to actually be completely out of your system. Or does that mean the people are on the road to recovery? I don't know what that exactly means. I don't know if anybody knows what that means. There's just so much information we don't know. But this 2% figure that they're throwing out there, I believe is is much lower than what the real mortality rate is. And that's just by doing the simple math. The only thing is, is China is being way more forthcoming than they were with SARS. There is no argument. We think. No, 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 no. We no. think. That's what the no, media is reporting. No, no. They didn't. With SARS, it, they didn't even like they didn't even tell the WHO until until months later. I mean, I, I China, yeah. So China, China took a lot of flack for how they. What does them. that tell you? I I'm tells saying, you that they think it's bloody serious. Well, or yeah, <laughs> or, they're, or they're being more forthcoming with their information. In I'm any not, regard, I'm not saying you know, it is right necessarily. I'm just saying they're being more forthcoming than they were. I'm going to repeat what I said yesterday. There is a lot of risk here in this market that is not getting priced in. Is there risk that we're all going to die and have the zombie apocalypse? I said this yesterday. No, I don't think so. But there is risk that there could be the mortality rate could, it can, could it continue to increase, that the number of cases goes up. And China's a mess right now. There, I can't fathom you know, how this market is just holding on and holding on as well as it is. It's just going to show you either, you know, either they're going to get the thing contained and it's going to be a non-event. And that's what I hope. That's what the market is saying yep. is happening. Yep. The market is pricing that's in That's what the market is saying. It the, is. It is. The market is. is pricing in that we are on top of this. This is going to get contained. It's not going to be spreading to all the other countries. It is pricing that in. If it is wrong, this market has a significant fall from where it is today. So I hope the market is right. I hope we get it contained. The market is pricing in containment because otherwise it would be substantially lower. Yep. I agree. Uh, about five minutes ago, we were talking about IBM, and I just wanted to give a, just a real quick. We popped up. You had 45.79 was the high on earnings day, but then the last two days after that, you've had lower. You had lower highs, and they surrounded the 144 area. Your pre-market high, after hours high on the announcement came 143.92. So I think for IBM here, got to take out 144 close over 144 and i think that you know you got a continuation rally here uh but <clears throat> longer it takes to get to 144 take that out maybe challenge at 45.79 uh little skeptical here of the rally especially the people that got beat down buying this um off the good earnings report this is like it's right back up to where it was so we'll see we'll see what happens it's holding in there it's holding the bid up 553 Let's see what happens in IB. It's been a sell the rip market to a certain extent. It's sure. been a buy the dip market too. Like yesterday, if you were buying the dip and you sold yesterday, I mean, just fading the moves has been making money in the short term. I said, I think the buy the, I said yesterday, I think the buy the dippers are on the wrong side of the trade. But I tell you, if they sold yesterday, right. they're on the right side yep. of the trade. They, yep. So sure. I haven't been doing any buy the dipping, but I've been doing sell the ripping. I sold more stocks yesterday um, into the rip. I was like, there's just so much risk here. I just, and, and the insurance is so that. cheap. Like, I can't believe how cheap the insurance is. Like I was, I was buying those spy puts, the, the 325s for like three bucks, like going out four weeks. That's one and a half percent when you when you do the math, like a little bit over. But if you want to even go out further, you can even get it cheaper for one to two percent. You can hedge yourself right now. Sounds cheap, doesn't yeah. it? 
Yeah, I agree. I did agree. you? Did you? Uh, what do you? What do you? What have you been buying with puts? Uh, uh the same. A little bit. Uh, the three twenty five, three twenty six is. How far and, are you going and, out? Uh, a month. A month. Yeah, I'm the same thing. I yep. never buy puts, guys. I, I, have you been watching the show for six, seven years? Yeah, I've never heard Dennis say he bought puts. I've never, never, never buy puts. But it's so bloody cheap. I'm like, I think the market makers just are not pricing in any of this. And I think it's all algorithmic. And they see what's happening. It's all VIX related. And I, don't, I think that they're mispricing the risk. I don't think they're assessing it correctly here right now. And that's why I was like, I'll buy cheap insurance on my portfolio right now. Because, hey. If I'm wrong, I lose one and a half percent. If I'm right, I'm going to protect a lot of my, like I'm not saying right. If I'm saying if it continues to spread that the weight rate it's going, I'm going to protect a lot of my net worth. So cheap, insurance is cheap. It's still cheap today. All right. Uh, the week, um, we have uh, some other reports after the close, correct? Let's we say, have a lot of reports. Let's do them. Uh, let's rip them. We got, uh, it's 826. S&P's hanging in there, down 1550. Uh Really quiet. I'd like to see this thing up in mid range here. That's uh, 8175, but eerily quiet here uh, in the pre market during the pre. Everyone must be listening to the pre market prep show and then they do their trades afterwards. Oh, that must be it. Okay. Western Digital reported after the close yesterday Q2 adjusted EPS 62 cents versus a 57 cent estimate. So beat there. Sales 4.2 is a slight, 4.2 billion is a slight miss. 4.22 billion was the estimate. Uh, they gave us some guidance for the current quarter. Earnings per share guidance was higher than the estimate. Sales guidance was also higher. Than the estimate, so strong guidance for Western Digital and a mixed report. The numbers here too. We're just yeah. seeing a lot of pretty good reports. These are good numbers for Western Digital. Yep. Very Problem good. is, we got overhead supply you're opening into. Exactly. Exactly. I'll make this one quick. Seventy-one ninety. Uh, that was uh, your high at uh, six o'clock, right uh, after the number came out. Seventy-one ninety. What's your recent high of the move? 72 even. So, boom, that's my target there on the long side. Let's get up to 72, take out 72, greener skies ahead. Longer time it takes to get up to 72, take out 72, maybe get a little bit of a rollover here. But uh, good numbers, nice confluence with the after hours high and on your daily chart. That's the kind of stuff. Better confirmation than you know, like that Amazon high at 2133.78, you have absolutely no reference point with that because well, it's like, what, 80 bucks above its former old time high. But uh, so that's what I'm looking at in Western Digital. Let's go to uh, Visa here. Visa. Yeah, uh, ticker V. They also reported after the close yesterday. As I pull the chart up, uh, Visa Q1 EPS, a buck 46 is in line. Sales beat 6.1. For six point oh seven billion dollars uh, for Visa, and uh, they gave some guidance as well, but their Q two revenue outlook did not reflect any uh, coronavirus uh, ramifications. Pulling back, stock is still obviously in a significant uptrend. They've been unbelievable. A little bit down, probably because Mastercard's numbers were better. So comparatively speaking, uh, Mastercard put in a better quarter. So you know, maybe expectations slightly higher. Mastercard didn't blow it away by any means either, but they did beat on the bottom line. Um, so maybe, you know, it'd be uh, expectations with them for at least to, you know, to beat on the bottom line and the inline numbers here, market, not loving it, not, not fabulous by any means. Blow also up. Amazon blowing it away. I mean, everybody's like, Oh, everybody's got to blow it away. So it didn't blow it away. The stock's been going up into the print. Not surprising that it relieves a little bit here and comes in a little, uh, let's go with 200. I'm just going to look at this to see the proof market low came in at two double oh seventy five couple daily lows right there at 200 99 so only two bucks away i think i'd be you know that's the level it looks like when you you take out 200 things open up pretty quickly here to 190 but important for it to hold uh 200 it's a little bit below the pre-market low only a buck a buck 10 away from yesterday's low so if you are buying this thing early you're looking for a gap fill Get out there at 203.30 and see if you get done. The close from yesterday, way up there at 208.21. I don't think we're going to see that today. All right, let's do energy. We got Exxon and we're about to get Chevron. I think they're typically at 8.30, which it is now. Yeah, I think they're probably just hitting the table. Uh, We'll do XOM since they were an hour ago. Q4 earnings per share, buck 33. Actually, let me pull a different thing here so I can get the estimates for you. Uh, So Exxon Mobil. 
It was. Oh, oh I haven't there. looked at that chart. Holy mackerel! There we go. So, uh, forty-one cent uh, EPS versus a forty-three cent estimate. Uh, revenue sixty-seven point one uh, billion versus sixty-five point one billion dollar estimate. So, a, a slight miss on the earnings and a slight beat on the revenue for Exxon. It was the, the candle yesterday makes me think if I was just trading technically and taking all this other virus stuff off the table, if I was just trading technically, I would say this looks like we would be a pullback that would be bought because you had a nice, you know, reversal day really yesterday. It wasn't a key reversal because it didn't make a new high, but a reversal day because it made the new low and then closed near the high. So I'll call that a reversal day. Um, you know, and obviously this follows oil as well. And oil has been the guy and oil reversed a little bit there yesterday too. So that's the good news. It was a nice candle yesterday. One nice candle in a series of, you know, red candles. So first green candle in a while. Um, that's the good news. Bad news is um, the stock is trading down the quarter, but I would not be surprised if you find support near yesterday's low. Let's say 6350. Dennis, you were just taking I I, I read the Joel Alconin technical just analysis book. Breakfast, but I already had breakfast. That's all. <laughs> I read the Joel Alcon and technical analysis book, the, the, the JETA book. It's good. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting the J, Joel Alcon in here. Right a little now. bit shorter than Edwards and McGee, but uh, <laughs> we got five pages in hers. <laughs> same thing here. You know, challenge uh, yesterday's low 63.43. You're kind of creeping your way towards there. So that's your uncle point. But boy, oh boy, relative performance. This stock is trading below where it was in August of 2015, I think. So if you had a lot of people were banging the drum on, uh, you know, on the energy sector, underperforming, looking for it, that's just like the laggards just continue to be laggards, you know, unless there's a big sentiment change. I mean, crude's certainly uh, not helping with it, you know, being down. And uh, why don't we do Chevron too? Uh, are they out? Yes, they are out. Okay. Q4 just EPS, a buck 49. Versus a buck forty-five estimate, sales thirty-six point three five billion. Versus a thirty-nine and a quarter billion dollar estimate, so light on their sales and a slight EPS beat. I, I think same thing. I think you're going to find support here, even one ten. You're finding somebody sitting there holding right now. It's very early, one hundred nine oh six near yesterday's low. You got support there too. I think you find support in these. So obviously yep. if the market turns over and starts rolling over. Everything's going. So you got to consider the market effects. But market holds up. I think these stocks can hold up if the market holds up. This one has held on much better than Exxon Mobil. It always has. It, yeah. How come? Chevron's been the best one. I mean, really, when you look at them all, um, you know, Conoco's held up not bad, too. Obviously, some of the smaller ones have just been annihilated, but there's concerns of them being going concerns. Um, but yeah, Chevron's held up much better than Exxon. Uh yeah, I'm just looking at this on a, I mean, it made an all time high in 18 or at the end of 17 and just kind of been hanging out here. I don't like the way the daily looks, the way we've come down 10 points over the last few days. And I look on the monthly chart. Oh, man, 100022. Yeah, we're not going to see that today, I don't think. But you just at the low, at the, you've been in a trading range here since, you know, since the beginning of 2019. You're testing the low of the trading range here. And that low of that range is from the month of 10906. So this thing better get off the mat, get away from 110 pretty quickly here. I'm looking for more downside and see. Uh, I'm on the other side here. I think we see okay, a bet. Be... We have, we'll just do a Friday bet. Okay, what do you want? And this is very early. We're like in price discovery here on Chevron. Okay. So this is like we could this bet could be settled here in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. What do you want? I will say. This hits, it's 110. Well, it's hard because it's like a dollar spread right now. So we almost got to go in the middle. It's because 110.88 offer, it's oh. 110 bid. So let's go 110.40. That's the fair price. It's right in the middle of it. And yeah. actually, the offer is a little bit thicker than the bid here. So I'm trying to stall even a little bit because I want to see where it's going to go. <laughs> <laughs> but 110.40, I think this thing sees 112.40, which is two points up before it sees 108.40. Uh, two points down. And that's probably going to happen a day. I could uh, be proven wrong in the next minute because okay. this thing is no liquidity anywhere. <laughs> Should we just say it's got to be intraday too because this thing's still going to chop around here right or now. You wanna... I okay. mean, if a thousand shares came in here and sold right now, this thing would be down to 108. There's nothing I'll in the book. I mean, I don't know. I'll, I'll Let's throw... do a bet for fun. We're, we're totally flat, we, right? We, on lunches? We haven't had I, a I, I think we're flat on lunches. You still owe me like 25 steak dinners, but I think we're flat on lunches. We haven't had a bet on this show in probably like four months. Really? It's been a long time. It's overdue. Okay. Yeah. 
right. the one ten seventy. Those offers are starting to come down though. So if you I'm don't make the bet like, soon, if you don't so, make the bet soon, I'm going to be dude. backing off the bid. Okay, <laughs> okay. 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 It just ticked one eleven forty. He took it. No, that's I, thin. That's an old print. Okay. It's one ten. You know what? I'm I'm out. One ten fifty. Sure, offers, I just accepted. Are I just lifted your offer. Did you hit my bid? Did you high frequency my bid? This would be a fight in the pit right now. <laughs> did you hit my bid or did you not hit my bid? Okay, so one ten forty. I said one twelve forty before one oh eight forty. Okay, the bat's on. I'll give it to you. Lunch. Lunch. On a lunch. Right. Okay. That is on. Right. I think it's it hits one twelve forty. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm put on a bullish bet, guys. I'm not this eternal beer here right now. I know that this is I'm gonna get so, punished for going bullish on anything, especially an oil stock. Yeah, this is so anti This is this is so out of my this is I'm gonna lose this bet in like the next 10 minutes. And I, I do say it's gotta be intraday. So because it's gonna chop around here, and I don't want to see you go, oh, it trade 108 40 in the pre-market for one second and then trade. Okay. Up. It's gotta be intraday. Okay. This is a buy. It's gotta be intraday. It's 9 30. So nothing that's bet doesn't start till 9 30. Okay. All right. One twelve forty over one to one. Binary. It's a, just a one day option. It expires. Okay. okay. Let's bring on our guest now, Jonathan Corpina. He He's probably a, tired of listening yeah, to us. Maybe he, I is. Think he is. Senior <laughs> managing partner at Meridian Equity Partners. Jonathan, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Nice to nice to hear you guys spicing it up this morning with uh, with your bets and your your little chattering back and forth. <laughs> you just talked about fights in the pit. Do you ever see any fights on the NYSC floor? <laughs> Uh, you know, fights, I think, is a tough word. Definitely, you've got arguments. you know people, you've got arguments, you've, right? So we're traders and we're representing our clients and we're paid to get our clients the best price and the best liquidity. So, yeah, sometimes there is a little, you know, challenging back and forth, but we all have the best interest of our clients uh, in hand. So that's the, you know, at the end of the day, we, we're, we're all friends, but, you know, what, what we get the clients and, and the best price is, is really the priority. All right. You don't have to answer this question. But have you, ever, have you ever been fined? Have I ever been fined? I personally have never been fined. Um, you know, definitely rules and regulations on the floor from anywhere from, you know, running to cursing to, uh, you know, making sure you're wearing your jacket and tie. You know, we'll, we'll put fines of, uh, you know, trading fines in a different category. But no, I, I've never I've never been fined. I certainly have seen people be fined for some activities, you know, relating to interaction with other, with other members. But uh, usually, it, it, you know, once, once a fine comes out, which is very, very rare, um, you know, things kind of quiet down quickly. A better uh, question. So Joel, was Joel O'Connor yes, ever fined yes. for being, you were? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Joel's I, I, feisty. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Did you throw I, down with somebody, Joel? No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the trading cards I, that I have, yeah. I use one in my wallet here. Well, um, can you show show the trading card? I will. I gotta have to stand up. Uh, <laughs> he still he still uses a trading card. Yeah, I, I took a five years. Here, right here. <laughs> can we see it? It says this is this says buyer. Oh, it. right. well, it's hard to read it, but we see the. It card. says buyer, okay. and then it says seller on the other side. Yeah. There you go. Okay. You can see it. Then it says cars as the number of contracts, the month, and then let's say I did a trade with Triple D. I put Triple D on there. It's clearing house Goldman Sachs. I believe they were 180, the price, and then the bracket that it took place in. So in the pit, when you're a pit clerk, these would get done, and you could throw them to the to the clerks, right? And you could throw it, and you could curve it around. Well, throwing throwing cards was illegal. You weren't supposed to do it, but like everyone did it all the time. You would look, see if there's security guard around. You whip it to the desk. The clerk would catch it. And there'd be a guy, I can't remember, I think it was Jerry, like he would wait for me and he would like be hiding around the corner and then like he'd give you a warning, give you a warning. And then the third time he'd come, boom, I'm writing you off. And he'd be like, oh, no, you know, please don't do it. And I think it was like a $50 fine or something. So that's the only <laughs> time I've been fined. But uh, Jonathan, what's the view on the floor here? You've been around for a while. You've been through different, yeah. different things here. Demis was talking how you know how cheap the insurance is here. Um, just what's the mood on the floor here, and what's your perspective uh, of doing any potential hedging at these levels? Yeah, you know, kind of interesting coming into the year um, and and you know, backing up a little bit in end of December. The headlines that we've been focusing on and have been really kind of moving the markets either way are the same headlines that we've been watching all month. But then, you know, you throw this coronavirus headline out there. A few weeks ago, it was the um, uh, Iran and Iraq and what was happening there. So, so these two headlines definitely added some pressure to our markets. 
um, more so the coronavirus. It seems like what, what happened in Iran uh, was kind of quickly uh, recouped and the market reacted very quickly to that. But now with this coronavirus, the uncertainty and as to how this plays out is, is really putting pressure on our markets here. And I think as as traders, you know, we're waiting for this next negative headline to fall. So I think there's a little bit of, you know, apprehension, a little bit of waiting on the sidelines to see when this next headline is going to come out. We'll continue to talk about impeachment and interest rates and tariffs and oil prices. Like, all those things will still play into the part of it, but the uncertainty as to how this coronavirus is going to affect, um, you know, globally have the effect. And, and, and we're understanding the magnitude of this as we get into earnings season and as we hear companies talk about the coronavirus in a very short period of time that this came up and now earnings season has started and they're talking about it on their conference calls and what they are doing to protect themselves, um, you know, mostly in, 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 in you know, Amazon calls and, and uh and um, Apple, but we, we, you know, it's something that it's it's definitely putting this apprehension into our markets. So we're in this wait and see kind of pattern. Not too many positive headlines on the coronavirus just yet. Um, so this is kind of forcing this pressure that we see here, and probably rightfully so, right? I mean, our markets have have been strong. They've continued to trade up. We continue to talk about what's going to be the next catalyst. And the next catalyst, we probably knew that it was going to be something unknown to us, right? It wasn't going to be a China tariff headline. It wasn't going to be the Fed doing something way out of the ordinary. It was going to be something that we weren't really predicting. So this, this was it. This is it. It's just a question of how long does this play? How long does this continue to affect our markets? And what about, uh, you know, everyone has different levels and different, you know, points of pain or and for me, I mean, I just can't get last Friday's close out of my head. That was, uh, th- I'm just talking the June S&P futures, 32.9350. Uh, we snuck above it two days this week. We haven't been able to close above it. So like to me, and it, you know, Dennis is talking how the market, the market's not afraid right now. The market is pricing that this thing is going to get, um, you know, resolved and, and quickly. Um, for me, so to me, for the market, really to prove that to me, it's got to close above Friday's Friday's close. And here we are five days away. We're 20 points away. That can happen on the downside. I'm just looking at Monday's low and Monday's low was pretty close to Tuesday's low and Tuesday's low was pretty close to Thursday's low. So I, you know, I'm going to reserve, you know, saying, Hey, we're due for more downside until we take out that low. I'm so probably happen over I think now. what Joel's asking you, are you watching the levels of the traders on the floors watching the levels as well here to get an indicator of, you know, maybe the market, you know, if you think of the efficient market hypothesis, I'm not sure if everybody believes that anymore, but are, are you looking at the levels here to get a feel for maybe where the next move is? Yeah. I mean, look, I think, you know, we've been watching it with that, that 3250 in the S and P as it, as it, got below there and then bounced right back above that level. Um, but the volatility, these, you know, these, these percentage moves, these swings that we're seeing is kind of forcing us to watch these levels here in a very short period. 3,300 on the upside, obviously doesn't look like we're going to get there today, but I think that would be someplace um, that, you know, investors would feel more comfortable. But if we break down and get below that 3,250 level again, um, I think we're going to see some downside to that. The only thing that might help us in a very, very short period of time is, yes, today is the end of the month. Um, so, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, smaller rebalances that are going to occur on the close today, a lot more volume, a lot more liquidity. We might see a little bit of support as we get towards the end of the day. But unfortunately, as we've seen last week and the week before, going into the weekend, it seems like, the, you know, the, the, the risk off trade is weighing more than the risk on. So we're going to see those two, those two you know, concepts work against each other today. Do we get this Friday, uh, you know, risk off trade or do we get this liquidity that comes in at the end of the month and get some support that's there? That's going to be interesting to see. We won't get a good feel of that probably till closer to, you know, two o'clock New York time today. We're on the line with Jonathan Corpina, Senior Managing Partner at Meridian Equity Partners. Uh, And we were just discussing this on a pre-pre-market show. I mean, if he, if someone would have told you Amazon's going to be up 216 points, uh, I mean, and the chances of the S and P being red, uh, I mean, have you seen this kind of, uh, you know, um, divergence? I mean, Tesla, obviously Tesla's Tesla, Apple blows it away. Microsoft blows it away. I mean, yeah, just, yeah. 
when have you seen this kind of divergence between, you know, some individual stocks, which, you know, if you're trading the stock, the stock is the stock in the overall market. Yeah, these things are these things are outliers, right? I mean, and and they have their own stories and the stories are good. But, you know, these companies are not immune to, um, you know, the things that we've been talking about, the coronavirus. They're not immune to interest rates and tariffs. So interesting how these companies, these standalones, you know, are moving in the direction they're doing with the velocity in which they're doing it. Yet the market still kind of is is trending and 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 and, and kind of uh, you know in, in their own spot. Kind of can't move up. You know, move, doesn't really move up and down. Just kind of bounces back and forth. And we're still waiting for some direction there. But clearly, these stocks have their own um, their own fuel behind them, which is completely making them outliers. But not surprising, right? I mean, you're coming into um, you know you're coming into Apple earnings prior to. And, you know, we feel secure and we feel safe that those numbers are going to be, you know, where they're going to fall in line. Um, they're not really big in talking about new products on their call. So that was normal. And as expected, they talked about coronavirus. Um, but, you know, clearly tariffs are going to play you know, a part there. We talk about Amazon, Amazon with their web services and their own delivery services that they continue to expand. I mean, these are massive, massive conglomerates that have enough cash on hand to weather any storm that we're either going through or might anticipate. So, so these are, these are two stocks that really have, you know, they, they, they're, they're part of our whole, you know, ecosystem, but yet they're in their own atmosphere. And uh, just what about, I mean, we had the fed meeting on Wednesday, kind of a yawner, kind of what we all expected. What are, what are you looking for from the fed for the remainder of the year? Uh, listen, I think <clears throat> as the fed has always, relied and said that, you know, they're going to remain data dependent. So we'll, we'll put that in one category. Okay. Um, it, you know, the data dependence is going to be something that they're going to continue to watch and look. And, and the data does support, um, you know, the position that the Fed has, has put themselves in at this point. Really, it's going to be the unknowns. They've been able to at the end of, um, well, halfway through 2019 and all the way through the end of 2019 have used China and tariffs as their excuse. We get now to January. They continue to use January, uh, China and tariffs as their excuse. And now you throw a coronavirus in there, global uncertainty, what happened between uh, with, with, uh, with us and Iraq and that situation there. So that whole thing there, the Fed has this ability to kind of cherry pick headlines and cherry pick global issues to somewhat hide behind to say, listen, you know, there's this uncertainty that's there and we're going to wait and we're going to try to see how this all plays out. They continue to do that. At some point, um, they're going to have to make a move. I don't know if it's sooner or later. And then, you know, go back again to where we were, um, you know, three and a half years ago and talking about the Fed and interest rates. As we get closer and closer to this election, the Fed might not want to make a move. They might not want to, you know, change where they are because could, you know, possibly there could be a change in administration. That's always up in the air. And we saw this back in 2016, where they kind of waited and waited and waited for something to occur for the results of the election. So they're kind of playing against the calendar and global issues, and they're, they're doing a, a juggling act here. So unless they do something by June, I don't think we're going to see anything for the rest of the year. All right. Jonathan Corpina is a senior managing partner at Meridian Equity Partners. Jonathan, thanks a lot. Gentlemen, thanks. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. You too. All right. And just right. to just to follow up on that point you made about cash, I believe Apple has the uh, cash equivalent of New Zealand's GDP in just in cash. So they 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 can weather a few storms. I don't understand why Apple did the whole debt raise. Like, I mean, they were saying, oh, it's cheap money. They didn't know what to do with it anyway. So now they've got this debt and they've got all this cash. <laughs> yeah. They always had zero. And then they were, you know, well, the market money is so cheap. Why would you not borrow money? And you know, they almost got talked into it. And then they still sit there with all this cash. Is that not, you know, they're, they're doing better with their cash. Maybe they're investing in the market. I don't know. But they're doing better with their cash than they are with the borrowing. And I mean, it doesn't make sense. So I don't know why they don't know. If they want to keep holding that much cash, why not eliminate all the debt? Unless they're planning on big acquisition or something, which is, is an Apple style. I don't know why they have all this debt. When was the last big Apple acquisition? They've never really done it. But it's not their stuff. What, Joel, do you know? I, it's, there's little ones, but I mean, Apple's I'm, never done a big one. Yeah. Their, it's their style to innovate and invent and do it on their own. It's not really their style to come in and, and scoop up growth. Like they have never done like a red hat, like you know what IBM just did. I I, I can't remember one. 
maybe early days, maybe in the early days, but nothing in the recent, like, like not nothing recently. Yeah. All right. Let's, so, go, back, let's go back to the, uh, the earnings parade here. There were a few more I want to get. Uh, we EA. did WWE. Uh, okay. Well, let, let's do EA and then we'll do WWE. Uh, okay. WWE had guidance. EA had earnings. Uh, it, it was, it was not great. The earnings were, were uh, fine. The earnings beat by two cents, two fifty two. Uh, versus a two dollar and fifty cent estimate. The revenue was light though, one point five nine billion versus one point nine six billion on the estimate there. So light, uh, much lighter on the revenue number than than the beat on the earnings number. Stock was off significantly. Uh, again, you know these. Uh, you know, and we haven't talked esports in so long, but the esports stocks, um, you know, even the gaming stocks have come back nicely. I've got Activision in the long term portfolio, and I have Take Two in the long term portfolio, um, and both of those have done very, very well. Um, obviously, Activision was in the gutter for a long time. I bought it around fifty dollars. It was a painful trade because I was at least six months to nine months just hanging out, but I kept sticking with it. Mostly because Michael Pactor is on our show, and he said, I think it's a double in two years. And he said this about a year ago now. So he's got one year to get there, Michael. But you know what? It's starting to work out. It's starting to work out a little bit more. I'm up about 20% in the trade so far. Um, I love Michael Pactor when he comes on. I really believe in his analysis, although he's wrong on some things and he's been wrong on Netflix, but he's right on a lot of stuff too. So uh, going back to EA, off the lows, I feel like there's underneath demand in these stocks, and that's why it's already bounced. It has. It's bounced quite a bit here. Uh, you had Where'd it go down to? 103.20. So we're seven points off. We almost got all the losses back. Yeah, yeah. I so- mean, PayPal yesterday, too. PayPal got it all back as well. The stocks that are really loved, um, and not that EA is loved, but the stocks that have been in significant uptrends in the last few months, and they pull back, there's bids underneath these things. P- PYPL was impressive, candle yesterday. I mean, my overall market helping that, but got all the losses back. I mean, EA's almost got it all back, too. Uh, interesting here. You're trying to get over the low from yesterday at one ten thirty one. So I'll use that as your first potential resistance point. Um, also one eleven sixty four. Uh, that was closed right near the high. So you're still, you know, you're still within yesterday's range. It's just on the downside here. If they don't start to scoop this up pretty quickly, um, I could see some trades going off in the one oh eight handle. I see one, two, three, four lows, and let's call it 108.50. Uh, then you drop off to 105 after that one. But uh, get above yesterday's low, get the close, get green, pretty close to the highs of the move. High of the move came in at 114.13. So we'll see what happens early, see if we can get green after being such deep in the red. What happened to WWE? Yeah, honestly? it is. It is my biggest. Uh, it, it, oh. is, it is by far the biggest loser on my. Did they say they're never going to make money again. Like, what did they no. say? There's actually, I think, there's only one stock in the in the universe. There's a penny stock that's down more, but non-penny stocks is nothing even close to WWE this morning in terms of uh, you know downward pressure. So here's here's what they said yesterday. They, uh, they, two, uh, two of their co-presidents are out. Uh, the co-presidents who were uh, promoted in 2018, uh, the chairman and, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, two co-presidents, they're out. And while they announced that, they also announced uh, they gave some guidance. They gave some adjusted operating income guidance, uh, and they they lowered it by 10 million dollars from 190 million to 180 million. Um, and that knocks 25% yeah, off the price? I, I, I mean, don't know. A, a, apparently so. Oh, they don't lower guidance in this market. Jeez, are you talking wow. about what, punishment? Dollars? Somebody yeah. was saying and, in the chat and, body slammed it. And and two wow. and two of their their co presidents are are out, which you know, I, I these these are the guys that reported to to Vince Vince McMahon directly. So good thing it wasn't 20 million. Because the stock would be at 20. It, <laughs> It, it seemed like the there was a strong disagreement on the on the direction of the company. So here is the issue with buying the dip on this today, and I know a lot of people are going to lick their chops to be able to buy a stock down twenty five percent, and maybe it bounces. But this stock was not in an uptrend coming into it. If you look from the last year, in back in April, we were over a hundred dollars, sixty two. So there's a lot of people who are basically significantly underwater in the stock. A stock like PayPal, when it pulls back on earnings or, you know, it's a slight disappointment, an initial slight disappointment, there's underneath demand there because there's so many people who are 
um, you know, wanting to be long that stock has been such a good stock. There's not that many people that want to be long in this kind of stock because it's not been a good stock for a long time. So these are the kind of stocks that you see these dogs and they just continue to leak and they continue to drift lower. With that being said, I'm never short in anything 25% in the hole. So I just a no touch for me. I can't come in here buying the dip though, thinking it's going to bounce back. I like, you know, the EAs or the PYPLs, the dip buying on them makes more sense. WWE, it's down, yeah, a lot, 25%. But, you know, this was down a lot last night when I looked at it, it was 53. And you thought, wow, they're really hitting that. Well, it's 46 here now. So I think you got to let the dust settle on this one before even thinking about, you know, let it have a double bottom in place or something from a couple of days where lows are in the same area before even sniffing this one. All right. We're going to bring in a, a special guest here. Uh, Jake Shub now. Remember Dennis? Ah, Shubs. Yeah. Well, first of all, all that great content that you see on Benzinga.com and all the great writing in my articles. Well, it's responsible. Chubbs is responsible for it because he, he edits it. <laughs> And he came back on, he was on the show in October and he told us how bad the WWE on-screen product had become. And we did not take note of it. And <laughs> here you go. So we're going to put some pressure on Chubbs here. We're going to bring him in. What do you do now? The stock's down 25%. What, what are your comments on this? Let's just get his comments. He's a, you watch, do you still watch? Are you still a fan? Are you still watching wrestling? I'm still a fan, but I haven't been watching much of it at all, to be honest, in the last and few you're, And you were a really? hardcore fan for oh, a while, yeah, were you yeah, not? Hardcore. Well, like I told you, it's just it's it hasn't been a very engaging, let alone like quality show for you know a couple of years now. Mm. Um, they've had some competition come in in October on TNT, and it's not like a, competing against their main Monday night product and their main Friday night show, but it's definitely eating into the audience a little bit. And so I never would have thought – it would fall this much, but I'm not, I can't say I'm surprised that it's, it's, it's starting to show that they're bleeding subscribers on the network and that the ratings are still trending down. Uh, I think it's like kind of consistently un- around 2 million viewers for their Monday night show, maybe a little bit more for the Friday night show. And I'm sure when Fox bought the rights to that, what was that a couple years ago for half a billion dollars or whatever it was, I'm sure they're hoping for a lot more than that. And so far it's, it's been better than it was, in terms of viewers over the past like four or five years, but not, um, not a huge incremental increase. So it sounded like there was just a big disagreement in, in terms of the direction of the company, right? Vince, it sounded like Vince wanted one thing and these, these guys wanted another thing. And yeah. And at the same time, I think, you know, Vince McMahon is in his mid early, mid seventies, you know, he's is trying, he, he's, that old? he's about to launch the XFL in, a while. in two weeks. So I think he's, he's kind of distracted and he's, for the first time in 40 years, pulling himself away from the the company itself a little bit when he used to, you know, he's been known for sleeping two hours a night and working until 2 a.m., going to the gym and then waking up at 5 a.m. and writing scripts for the shows and that kind of stuff. And I, I it's a good thing that he's going to be stepping out of the way, in my opinion, but uh, I think it's showing uh, they don't have much direction right now, at least in terms of the, um, the overall business. Yeesh. Yeesh. All right. Well, the chart, I think, says it all this morning. Um, how much of this you know wwe and you know i've always thought this too is like my 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 dad was a big wrestling fan for years and he doesn't watch any of it anymore because all he watches is ufc how Mm -hmm. much is the ufc eating the wwe's lunch oh i'm sure the last what is it 10 15 years since the ufc has really become mainstream i'm sure that's a big part of it um there's i mean it's real versus not being real Exactly. Oh. And, and and I know when my older brothers were in high school and college, they they their friends were always talking about, you know, Monday Night Raw and the Monday Night Wars back in the day. And then when I was in high school and college, all the people I knew were talking about, uh, you know, Conor McGregor and uh, the Iceman. Yeah. I forgot who's the Iceman back then, the UFC fighter. George so, George St. Pierre, maybe yeah, a some, couple of those some, guys. George but something. It, it was noticeable, at least like I, I used to, you know. The older people talked about WWE, and then it became UFC, and now they're both kind of in the mainstream, but not nearly as you know, as as much as they were yeah. twenty years ago. And also, the UFC is on ESPN; they pay them a boatload of money. So, yeah, so that probably helps. <clears throat> Back in my day, it was like Ali Frazier, George Foreman, Ken Kent Norton, yep. the Thriller in Manila. Yeah, those that. I mean, I miss. I don't even know who the heavyweight champ of the that, world. Well, that is shows right you now. just that's yeah. just shows yeah. Who's the heavyweight <laughs> champion of the world? Shubs. Is it you no? Know? Wilder, 
is it this is market? bad when you when shows is a hardcore fan, you start Second losing Joel's your hardcore day. fans. This is not good. Back in Joel's day, it was Joe Lewis. All right. Uh, I, I was, well, well, Dennis, were you talking about boxing or wrestling? I saw no, wrestling. Oh, he was talk, we're talking WWE. Talk about different things now. No, okay. we're not box. It's a it's a wrestling stock. We're talking well, WWE. Who is well, the heavyweight I'll, champion of the WWE? I don't know if this is a f- reflection of it or not, but Brock Lesnar is currently the heavyweight champion for WWE. Uh, yeah. And if you think about it, he was back in the company 20 years ago. And so they're still trying to milk that well. <laughs> Brock, when they, when, well, you know what would really be milking if they brought Hogan back and Hogan became the champion? I don't, he, that I would, would be good. I wouldn't put it past them. They say they're going <laughs> to pay. would be him, good. They say they're going to pay him a bunch of money to go to their next uh, Saudi Arabia show next month. And so I'm sure Hogan, be, the new champ. Could you imagine? How old is Hulk Hogan now? He's old. He's got to be. He's got to be. He's in early sixties, maybe. He's got to be in the sixties. Yeah. Yeah. Is he? Is he still governor of Minnesota? That was the other guy. That was <laughs> Jesse Ventura. <laughs> Jesse the Body Ventura. <laughs> Jesse the Body Ventura. He was the whole start. Jesse the Body Ventura was the start of celebrities becoming politicians. All right. Wasn't he? He was like the start of it all. Yep. Because I think Schwarzenegger was maybe the next term after him. Uh, in yeah, I think so. And then he realized, hey, you just need a name. You'll win these. You just need a name to win these elections. So, right, you J- don't need experience. You just need a name. Jason Chubb now. Thanks a lot thanks, for Chubb. the insights. That was fun. Thanks, guys. Yep. Uh, Chubbs. Anthony Joshua is the heavyweight boxing champion of the world. You know what? I was a big Joe Frazier fan. I was cr- – and everyone in my third grade loved Ali, and I just – I wanted Joe Frazier. I don't know what uh, – why I like Joe so much. But uh, anyways – we got the boxing. We got the wrestling. But UFC right. probably ate boxing lunch more so than they yeah. ate the WWE's lunch. Because I don't hear anything really about boxing anymore. It's all about UFC. I mean, Mike Tyson was the thing when I was a kid. It was all about Mike Tyson. And obviously, you know, that all went to a circus show. But that was the thing. Like, Mike Tyson, think about, you know, like when he had a fight, everybody was watching it. And I don't know, has there been a Mike Tyson since Mike Tyson in boxing? Has there been somebody with that kind of draw? Yeah, yeah, Manny Pacquiao uh, was, was pretty you think, big. Though, you think you have the Tyson draw, though? I, I mean, don't know. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm too young to have, Floyd to have seen what, yeah. Well, Floyd Mayweather, but, you know, Floyd doesn't fight like Tyson. Like, Tyson was always the aggressor, you know? He's coming at you. No, Floyd sits back. He was, draw. you know, he was an, an, art, an artist more than anything. Like, he, in terms he of doesn't draw. get hit. You can't hit him. But in terms of defensive, defensive, you know, fighting back, he's always, yeah. you know, the, a lot, but Tyson was going to try to kill you. Yeah. That's why Tyson was fun to watch because like, he's going right. to go at you. And that's why Tyson, you know, lost to Buster Douglas. He's just not protecting himself. He's just going at you, going at you, going at you, and you get caught. So, but, um, no, but you I can't catch Floyd May- Mayweather. D- in, different type in of, of in terms of draw, Pacquiao Mayweather were, were pretty big. I don't know how they compared to Mike Tyson, but I'm a little bit too young to have seen Mike Tyson. Um, we're turning it into balls. Yeah, this, this, is, re- this is really getting off the Sorry, rails here. Folks. So, uh, all right, let's bring it back. Is there, do you guys have any, any final thoughts on this market? It's, it's, a, uh, it's a weird one here. We're, we're trying to bounce. There's all there's two effects happening here, and it's awesome to just watch, you know, the market. So you obviously have Amazon trying to pull up, trying to pull up the overall market. Um, and Amazon's just such an impressive quarter. You know, without Amazon's market would really be in the gutter today. It's up 205 points, up 11%. Such an impressive move. So that's trying to hold the market up. And then you've got this fears, this underlying fear still, what we've been talking about, the coronavirus and the unknowns. Um, there's going to be people who are going to be nervous into the weekend. I'm nervous going into the weekend. I'm nervous about the progression chart that we were showing you that's still holding it. So, you know, those numbers start to increase very uh, a lot next week if they hold that progression. So we need to get this thing contained over the weekend. Um, hopefully they come up with a vaccine. I mean, if they announce some type of vaccine, the market will rip up on that too. So that's your risk to shorting this market, which is why, you know, I, I was saying, you know, I think this market could have a downfall, but I don't want to be short the market overall because they announced some vaccine. This market could really rip higher there too. So that's a wild card. So puts is, buying the puts, I feel is like the safer play right now. Now it's a vaccine, you know, they get the thing solved. I'm willing to lose the one and one and a half percent bet um, for the next four weeks. Um, and, you know, obviously you may not even lose the whole thing. They announced the vaccine. There's still going to be some premium in there on those. But um, I, I don't know, like, how this is going to play out. I don't think anybody does. So that's why I was protecting myself to a certain extent. Uh, I mean, it's already not an inside day because uh, we did sneak over Thursday's high by a couple points. But I'm looking for just a real seesaw day today. I don't, you know, there's at this point, you know, there's nothing imminent, you know, that it's super bad news. You know, some people still feeling like they missed the chance to buy the dip. So I think as you head towards Thursday's low, 
the same area as Monday and Tuesday's low. I think you find some buyers. And I think if you, you know, rally up near unchanged, you, know, you find some sellers here. So I think it's going to be a lot of, a lot of chop and slop here and uh, see what happens. And then, you know, you get your, your 30 point up move or 30 point down move um, over the weekend. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I am looking at for today. Yeah, here's, here's the bottom here's, line. Here, yeah. here, here's the bottom line. This is a different kind of market. That's Kramer some love there, though. It is a different kind of market. That's a good point, Kramer. Good, good coming there. Yeah. I don't know how we, how did, how'd you get Kramer to say that? Because I'm watching him talk live on CNBC yeah. right now. He, uh, two, he places, <laughs> two places at once. So, uh, Kramer can be in two places. He's not fast. He's he can be in two bad. places at once. I just want to say this WWE here. I was just looking at it. Someone's trying to bring some stock in here. I'm not saying, you know, maybe it's just like, if you're short, I know Dennis, a lot of people don't short, but if you short the market, you get this kind of windfall you're along the weekly puts or something. You think so there's the, that many people? This was, it wasn't even a, a, an announcement, though. Like, this was out of the blue, right? This wasn't yeah. scheduled. Well, I don't even know if there's much open interest, just curiously. Like, I don't think there's a lot of people, you know, winning money here in WWE today on the short no, side. No, there's probably not like that. Even much. what's the open interest on shorts? I mean, you're looking at a stock. Well, oh, it's over 21% short interest here. 4520. Didn't uh, know that, it was that high. Yeah, that's where someone is. They're being comfortable. They're just sitting there. They're bringing some stock in. That's it. Yeah. If they, you know, if he decides to pull the bid and go down to 4480, then we'll go down to 4480. But there's, there's some sneaky buyer out there here at this level. We'll see if 4520 holds. If we rally, I have no idea where this thing's going to stop on a rally. You got so much uh, air above, but uh, boy, we're running real late. Yeah, here. it's okay. To, it's a Friday. We're going to have to sp uh, pay Spencer overtime. We're allowed on a Friday. Uh, I want to thank our guest, Jonathan Corpino. I don't get paid overtime? No. no. Thanks to everyone in our chat. No. Both chats, the YouTube you're chat, be out of lunch soon. and the pre-market dot bank. You suckered me into that bat. <laughs> you did. You made me buy the dip. How did you pull that off, Joel? You started you made it. Made me buy the dip. I'm losing this bet for sure. It looks like. <laughs> oh, you uh, made me buy the dip. Why did I buy? It? Never buy the dip. Buy or not on a on a stock in the gutter. You made me go against the trend. Not buying buying the dip is good, but not on stocks that are going straight down and downtrends. You made me buy a stock in a downtrend. I'll not let that you, I physically I'll let bought you it, out. But the bet was. Yeah. I'll let you out for a bag of chips and a coke. Done. Oh no! <laughs> I I lifted that offer pretty fast. Oh, oh my god! All right, done. Bag Look, of chips it, and a coke. Done. Lift that offer all yeah, day long. Yeah, Exxon Mobil's taking support. Really big bag of chips. It better be it's a big bag of chips. Be, yeah, no. uh, we didn't specify. I lifted that offer really fast. That was a high frequency lift right There's, there. That is taking his loss. That, that was the algo lifting that thing. Oh, I was just all right. Well, you threw it out there. I lifted that. That's a risk. You throw out your offer. I might lift it. Done. <laughs> Okay, uh, for a free two-week trial and a discount to Benzinger Pro, click on our link in the description of this video. You can always catch our show on YouTube or the podcast is available on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or tune in. Give us a call, 734-494-0246. Leave us a voicemail. We'll ask your question on the show or email us, premarket at benzinga.com. As always, please remember all the information from our show is meant to be used as informational purposes only, not for investing or trading advice. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Have a good weekend, and we'll be back with you on Monday.